this is weather that only okra can love. For a long time, my okra just sat there like that, and Powell Smith, one of our specialists, said, well, you just planted it too soon. Okra likes hot weather. Well, the okra is finally happy in my garden. And if you're going to be a gardener in South Carolina, you just have to get used to hot weather, too. Um, but it's nice and cool here, and we're glad, we hope that you're nice and cool at home. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Amanda McNulty with Clemson Extension, and this is going to be an hour of answering your gardening questions with Making It Grow, coming to you live from historic downtown Sumter. Teresa a lot is in the chat room, and she would certainly enjoy having you join her there. And as soon as we go inside, she'll tell you how easy it is to make that click and be a chatter. We also take wonderful trips on making it go. And gosh, McCormick County is kind of a long drive, but it's well worth it. A county that's heavily forested with that wonderful timber so important to our state, but also um, Lake Thurman there. And we visited a wonderful, wonderful garden Barb Hinkle has designed and created up there in that part of the world. Um, of course, Dr. John Nelson will be a, with us tonight with his mystery plant. We also have another special guest, Van McCall, who's with Ag South Farm Credit, and he's going to tell us about a program they've got to make sure that agriculture remains just as strong and important to South Carolina as it does as it is right now. We've also got some pretty smart extension agents here, and I know everybody's got questions because it's that time of year. So let's go inside and meet our guest. As always, Teresa Lott is so kind to come to us from Florence, where she's a water quality person. And I understand y'all are got children out in the yard and hosing them down or something like that. What you got going on over there, Teresa? Well, we hadn't hosed any down, but that's right. This week is 4H2O. That's a water-based day camp, and we're happy to have 20 wonderful children out at the PD Research and Education Center learning how to be watershed stewards today. We got to kayak. The Department of Natural Resources taught us about fish identification and fish anatomy and then one of my colleagues Mary uh, from Richland County helped us to collect macroinvertebrates uh, basically bugs on the bottom of a, a pond to assess water quality so lots of great things I hope you'll be a good watershed steward too if you need more information you can always uh, use your favorite web browser uh, search to look for Carolina clear and find great information I do hope you'll join me in the chat room too we already have six speakers and one viewer to do that go to the making it grow Facebook page look on the left side remember Facebook change things up click on the green let's talk icon you'll be prompted to join into the discussion in our chat room log in with Facebook, with Twitter, or Rumble Talk, and we should be chatting very soon. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, and it's such a pleasure to welcome people from the upstate, where maybe it's a little cooler, <laughs> and Millie Davenport, who's a county agent up, court agent up in Pickens County, and also um, keeps that HGIC website Yeah, going. that's right. Yeah, so good. Is with us. Um, what are the burning questions coming in? Lots of tomato questions, um, and of course, lots of programs going on and that kind of thing. And this week, I wanted to make sure I told you about our beekeep beginning beekeeping workshop that's yes. going to be this Thursday. Well, with um, Dr. Jennifer Saruda, our state apiculture specialist. And I've and met her. She yeah. really seems like a she fun is. person. You don't have to worry about her stinging you or getting <laughs> mad at you and buzzing at you, do you? But we're going to get in the hives, um, do some honey tasting, which is always fun. If so people want to know about that, where do they go? They can um, do a search for Clemson PSA Mall. Clemson PSA Mall. And their registration is available okay. online. And I bet we can get Teresa to be kind enough to put that on our website, too. Um, I know one of my master gardeners is real excited about coming awesome. up. Awesome. Um, and he said, oh, they even going to give me lunch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's included. But extension people <laughs> like to eat, don't yes, they? Yes, indeed. <laughs> and Corey Chandler is our horticulture agent in Greenville with a huge cast of people, volunteers, and all kinds of partners there. And um, the, the community garden, I know, of course, you wrote a book about starting community gardens. Well, a bunch of us did, a bunch yeah. of agents. We uh, came together and partnered on a, uh, on a, pam a booklet, an uh, extension publication called Starting a Community Garden. And it's a real popular movement nationwide in Greenville County right now. We have about 80 community gardens. 80? Yeah, it's a bunch and that we know about. There's probably some others that we don't know about. But basically, a community garden is a plot of land that a community comes together to, to maintain and manage. and. They do all sorts of good stuff with the with the produce and, and products that come off of that land. And and I think that even up there, y'all have an agency that is that's there to uh, make to send specialists. They have a problem. It just sounds like it's a well integrated and thought out program. Yeah, we have a nonprofit in Greenville called Gardening for Good, which uh, focuses on supporting the community gardening movement, and we work in partnership with them to to help 
um, answer their questions and master gardeners are involved and uh, we're just trying to keep the movement going. Okay, well it sounds like it's well established up yeah. there. Okay, and we are especially happy to, and to welcome Van McCall to our show. He's come here from Georgia and I think it was a long drive. He works with Farm Credit, he's the Chief Lending Officer for Georgia, but he has come to talk about a different interest that his agency is promoting. Van, what have y'all got on the books? We are here to, to talk about counting collards. Uh, our AgAware program is joining Ag South AgAware. We're joining with the South Carolina Department of Agriculture, Five Rivers Market, and Dupree at the Market at the West Columbia uh, South Carolina Farmers Market to feature the collard plant. And we're going to do an interesting community outreach program to have fun and educate kids and society as to how important that the collards and all agriculture is to all of us. That's and, on June 28th. And we are looking forward to learning more about that later. And you are right, so many people um, just think everything comes from the store or off the back of a truck. There's more to it than that. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And now we're going to check in with our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina. John, I mentioned earlier I might, I probably ought to come take another class so that I can have some comparison, but I know you would always be my favorite. Thank you for being with us tonight. How are you doing? Oh, Amanda, that's so nice of you to say that. But you'd always be welcome back in the class. Thank you. And, and things are going well, good. actually. Um, have you been botanizing or trying to get the herbarium straightened up? Well, I've been doing both. And um, that's actually what I'm going to be talking about when we um, go over the mystery plant tonight. I went on a special trip this past Friday to do some aquatic botany. Aha, uh -huh. well that ties in perfectly with Carolina Clear and all that because I'm sure we've got to have good water quality to have good plants. John, you do a tremendous service to um, us here at Making It Grow, to our Facebook friends, and to agents and individuals around the state by giving free plant identification. Woo! Thank you so much. And if somebody's got something that's puzzling them, what's the best way to get a picture to you? Well, the best way is just to send a uh, if you got a, 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 an electronic version of your picture, send it along as an email attachment um, to me, and that works. I get plenty of um, uh, messages sent that way to me with an image. Or you could put it in a, um, an envelope in a, or put the plant in a baggie with a little hole punched in the baggie. Um, and send it to me in the mail. That would work too. Okay. Well, um, so often we do just that, and we thank you for that service. And we'll be back a little bit later to find out about the puzzling mystery plant. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> and we have a caller. David is calling us from Banning, right down the road. David, thank you so much for giving us a call tonight. And what's going on in your garden? We can help you with. I planted a small raised garden. Six by sixteen, and I've got several beautiful tomato plants that's putting on tomatoes. I've got two, uh, got okra is really growing, and I've got beans that's running, and I've got a lot of candles smokes that I uh, okay. planted about five or six hills, and they're running everywhere. Okay, and they're what's your question tonight? Blooms. What's your question tonight? They're full of blooms, but I see no small cantaloupes on it. My goodness! I know it's got to have bees around to. Okay, all right. Okay, well, this is a bee question, and we've got Millie here. She just told us that she's having that workshop. Maybe you need to come up to Clemson on, um, to grow them out. So we can get some honeybees. Yeah, and, and learn how to get the honeybees. Um, are you still there, David? Okay, he's gone. Um, well, talk to us about what might be happening in his garden. Well, definitely, you know, first the plants put on male flowers. Uh huh. So the plant makes sure it has enough male flowers before it produces female flowers and puts the energy into making the female flowers. And we, we are dependent on those little pollinating insects like honeybees to move that pollen from the male flower to the female flower to properly pollinate. And it takes Multiple. several, yes, yeah. many, many, many <laughs> visits by the honeybees to move that pollen for proper pollination to occur and then for those fruits to form. So one of the most important things that we need to remind people, something people feel um, Cord that every time they see some holes in the leaves, they need to get out there and spray. Um, what's exactly. the best tactic to take as far as controlling pests or, or living with pests? Well, I mean, that's a broad subject, so there's lots yeah. of different aspects that go into it depending on the pest and, and what it is. So, number one, identifying the pest and determining if it is truly causing a problem or not. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, plants can sustain a lot of damage 
without actually it impacting yield um, and that sort of thing. And of course, you know, if you do have to resort to a pesticide for a particular plant, you want to apply it at a time when bees aren't foraging, uh, which is usually late in the evening, uh, late in the afternoon, the evening time period so that you don't kill those important okay. pollinators. But we're hoping that in this case, David, um, your plants are early in the process and that they just haven't put the female flowers yeah. on. But for everyone, do remember that um, trying to have a picture-perfect garden um, is, is not going to, might look pretty, but it may not have the fruits that you want to have. Right. Okay, thank you so much. And now we've got Michael calling us. These calls from North Carolina, Lumberton. I was up your way because I had to drive to Wilmington and almost made it to your nice town. And um, I hope it's not as hot up there as it is down here, Michael. It, it is, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're just trying to keep everything watered as much as we can. And, I and, know. Uh, trying to keep everything alive. But anyway, I've, I've got a little bit of a problem. I had a, I have a... a a magnolia tree that I had planted a couple foot in front of my house and uh, to train it to spire up on the side of the house kind uh -huh. of like and it has done good for probably six or seven years and it has really grown but uh, earlier in the spring I noticed there were some limbs dying on it well before I uh, realized what I had done I had took some uh, some clippers and clipped them off and and then, without thinking, I went to another tree and clipped some limbs off of it. Oh and I think I had a friend uh, look at it. This was, I went from the magnolia tree to a, a pear tree, and actually it, it spread to that. And uh, my friend told me he thought it was fire blight. And uh, I was wondering what you could recommend in, in this okay. situation. All right. Um, gosh. I know fire blights on pears, but I've never heard of magnolia. Right. Uh, yeah. And I'm uh, imagining maybe he had one of the um, little gems or smaller size magnolias that they encourage people to spy. Any thoughts? I suspect it's not related, even though that can be a problem, you know, sometimes moving. And fire blight's actually transmitted by the insects flying. Right. But, it, it, I mean, fire blight can be transmitted on pruners as well. It's a bacterial disease. Uh -huh. um, it can be transmitted on. Uh, pruners, but it's typically things that are related to apples, apples, pears, crab apples that are going to have problems with fire uh -huh. blight. As far as I know, magnolias aren't uh, susceptible to fire blight. He could have had possibly with the winter we had possibly some winter damage, or there could have been some other issue going on with magnolia, but it probably wasn't fire blight. At Calmia Gardens, we were looking at there. They had a long row of kind of shaded little gems, and boy, they were having dieback and mm -hmm. dieback and dieback, and we looked at it, and it turned out to be not the terrible ambrosia beetle that's right. killing they the will, persia, yeah. but it looked like sometimes those those magnolias would maybe stressed a little bit. There's right. a mag, an ambrosia beetle that comes, and that wouldn't yeah. be carried over at all, would it? Probably not. Uh, depends on the species of ambrosia beetle. Um, I mean, they'd just be in the yard. Right. The clippers yeah. wouldn't have to do it. Right, right. Um, yeah. So um, I hope that you can... Um, that if it is an ambrosia beetle, that that's one that's not systemic, I think, in its damage. And, um, but you know, it is interesting. We often think, and it's, but it's, some, it's just such a big world. There's so many things out there that a lot of right. times things can happen at the same time, and we like to yeah, tie we, them together. We think of pests and diseases in, in terms of plant families, and certain plant families yeah. are susceptible to the same diseases, um, and others aren't. But I, as far as I know, there's nothing really. Okay. There. Okay. All righty. Well, Mike's calling us from Malden. Um, we've got some people who had to drive through Malden to get down here today, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's happening in your yard, Mike? Well, Amanda, uh, thanks for your show. I've learned a lot. Appreciate and it. I have a question about, we'll just go to squash. Do they have male and female buds? And it boils down to no bees. Is there another type of insect or something that I might be able to order. I've noticed that the ants on the cucumbers seem to be making it uh, grow fruit. So you are Other getting cucumbers. Are... You are getting cucumbers. Yeah, I've got tomatoes, got cucumbers. Uh -huh. I know tomatoes do themselves. I have one more question. Okay. I'm sorry there's not an arborist on there, but my sister Corey, had a really Corey, giant, uh, really giant um, uh, oak tree and yes. a big limb broke off of it. And, you know, back in the day, everybody took the black stuff and spray painted where they cut the, the limbs yes. and things off. I was wondering if, the, if that's still advisable. Okay. All righty. Um, he's got fruits on his cucumbers. There are some types of cucumbers that um, don't, you know, rely on the insects like parthen parthenocarpic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to worry about it as much. Like, you can grow those in a greenhouse. Mm -hmm and you don't have to worry about the pollinating insects as much. So I'm not sure what variety of cucumber he has, 
that might play a part into the equation. Um, but I mean, if you get desperate, you can get a little paintbrush early in the morning, <laughs> send your kids out there and uh -huh. move the pollen around. Teach from the them flowers. about the birds and the bees. Exactly. Right. You okay. know, it's an opportunity. That's what I would have my kids doing. But <laughs> luckily, I've got plenty of bees. <laughs> How important is it to try to have a, a landscape that has other flowering plants in it to right, try to keep pollinators? Yeah, I was going to mention there are a lot of other pollinators. I mean, bees are obviously excellent pollinators, but there are a lot of other pollinators. I mean, flies, wasps, I mean, a lot of different things can pollinate yeah. crops. So having a diversity of flowering plants in your landscape mm -hmm. all the time to attract those other pollinators in is a good way to go about it if you don't want to hand pollinate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. I know, and I don't know if this helps, but I think it does because I see the bees on them. I let my college just go to seed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, it looks like the bees enjoy. I mean, right. so rather yeah. than just immediately pull them up, let them bolt, let yeah. them bolt. Uh, right. Things like that sometimes lots, lots some good things. strategies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of beneficial insects. And then like he's that. got a tree that lost a big limb, and he doesn't know if he needs to get up there and do something to it. Mm. No wound sealant. <laughs> uh, we don't recommend wound sealants or wound paints anymore. Um, that was kind of an old recommendation, but we found that they're better off without it. If it's a very jagged cut and he can reach it, if, if he can reach he it do? or hire an arborist to come in and yeah. trim that cut up to where it's not so jagged, if if that's possible, and not cut into the collar region, mm -hmm. which is right where that limb joined the main trunk of the tree. Yes. So leave that, leave the collar region intact. But if they can get in, get somebody in there to safely uh, trim mm -hmm. that. And just, back it'll heal and let it yeah. seal. Matter. We say tree seal; they don't heal, but okay. Um, but it's similar. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, well, gosh, we're gonna um, see what these guys know right off the bat. You know, we're just so proud to have them here. John says it's not too hard, so we're gonna check out John, John Nelson and find out about this mystery plant that he had to get out and go and get just for y'all. He said he made a special trip. John, what you got for us? Well, Amanda, as you know, I like to go um, do botany in aquatic places. Yes. And especially these days, I've gotten very interested in looking at the plant life of uh, ponds here in South Carolina. And I was so lucky for, I guess, two reasons this past Friday. Reason one, I was able to get out of the office. And reason two, I was <laughs> able to go kayaking. Good. Um, but, of course, it was work because I was collecting plants. And um, I was... Uh, very fortunate to be able to run into some sweet people named uh, Gordon and uh, Hannah Michael, and they allowed us access into their beautiful farm pond. And we found this plant that is just so lovely and just a very, very interesting plant. And uh, this is a plant that, of course, is insectivorous in that it will eat up little critters. Now, it's not like a pitcher plant in that it doesn't have great big leaves that act like uh, traps or funnels, funnel-like traps, but it has tiny little bladders on the lower parts of the plant that will um, snap closed when a little uh, bug or a tiny little worm gets close enough to it and suck it inside and then take out all the goodies and uh, it's like fertilizer for the, uh, the plant. Now this plant, you see it's got these beautiful uh, yellow flowers, but flowers don't really have anything to do with um, capturing the insects. That's all below the, uh, the water line. This plant is not a floating plant. I know some of you all know what this thing is, but this is not one of the species in that group that floats uh, with those floating, um, what do you call them, uh, sort of a rosette of floating structures at the surface of the water. This plant doesn't do that. It has its little um, <clears throat> modified roots and stems, uh, usually in floating mats. Mm. So it's a real boggy um, substrate. It doesn't really float. Mm -hmm. And it's got a beautiful shade of yellow to the flower. Well, it sure is pretty. And mm -hmm. it looks like a fun place to squish your toes in the mud, too. I, <laughs> like, I like the feeling of that. Um, I know you like to go tromping around. Do you ever take your boots off and squish your toes and encounter this little plant, Corey? I, very, I believe so. He uh, kind of gave it away there, but it's one of the bladder warts, I believe. Has he got it right? Well, of course he does. Woo um, Corey's a, a fine botanist. So okay. uh, this is a, one of our native bladder warts. And, um, I think they call some people call this fibrous bladderwort, but um, I guess because it's sort of fibrous looking down the line. All righty. <clears throat> it really is a pretty one. 
Well, that was beautiful. And um, I guess you know that um, Hannah Michael is, um, we think, you know, a member of one of the best organizations in the world. Because she's one of, she's a Clemson <laughs> Extension agent, knows a lot more than people like me, but um, she's smart like these guys we've got here tonight. And, and Gordon, of course, is also involved in helping people learn more about farming in a wonderful way with NRCS and is involved with lots of programs. So I'm glad you met such nice people, John. I'm glad they got to meet you, too, because I think you're, you're right up there with the best. And thank you, and we All will right. see you next week. All right. right. Well, I'll look forward to okay. it. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Teresa. Are people at home tonight and in the chat room, or how do you think the population of South Carolina is behaving? A few people might be home, but I suspect some folks are still out, probably having to water those plants, since I know at least in the Florence area, it has been hot, 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 and we have had about zero rainfall. So my grasp is grass is getting crispy. We've got 10 speakers and six viewers. There's still plenty of time for you to join in the conversation. Interestingly enough, it hasn't really been all that much about gardening. We got on a kick of um, what we like to eat and talking. we just started talking about chicken and dumplings and putting fried okra on food as a crouton. So who knew? You can apparently fry any small vegetable and put it on something and call it a crouton. You just never know what the conversation is going to be like. Uh, you know, just go ahead and join us. There's lots of room. Also, don't forget, keep liking that Making It Grow Facebook page. We have come a long way, but we can always have more friends. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. And um, remember that if you want to find out about um, Millie's program, um, Teresa's going to put a link there on Facebook if you want to go learn about bees on Thursday. And um, it's, our Facebook page is a great place. I think we've even had something about you've got to think a Master Gardener class coming up in Greenville. Right. Uh, and I think that we've got some information about that. When is that? Just remind us again. Well, the, the class is actually in the fall, but we're taking applications right now for the for the fall Master Gardener class in Greenville. We'd love to have people to uh, to submit an application okay. and, and join our great group. Well, they would learn a lot. It'd be fun. It's a great program, isn't it? Yep. Okay. All righty. Um, we've got a caller, um, Charles, in Bishopville, right up the road. Charles, thanks for calling us tonight. And how are things up in the great city of Bishopville? Well, Thank you very much for taking my call, Amanda. Uh, my problem is with my pear trees. Uh -huh. I have three pear trees, and uh, the leaves seem to turn black and dry up, and then it spreads to that particular branch, and it bends over and uh, begins to uh, blacken. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it looks like it spread from one tree to each of the other two that I have. Right. Um, well, I think we can give you some help. Yeah. Um, it's that shepherd's crook we talk about. Yeah, that and that's our earlier that fire was blight. A perfect description of the symptoms of fire yeah. blight, yeah. Uh, which we were talking about earlier, yeah. which apples, pears, crab apples, and even some of our ornamental pears, Bradford pears, are now susceptible yeah. to. So, what do you recommend? At this point, he's pretty much <laughs> left with pruning them out. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, that bacteria is systemic in the stem, so it will move down. So when, when you're into the lower parts of the stem, if it reaches the main trunk, it can do quite a lot of damage. So if, you, yeah. so if it's damaged, if this is like a branch and it's up here, how far back would you come? We usually say about eight inches below the visible okay. lesion. All right. Um, it can be, you can go further than that if you need to, but at least about eight inches below the where you can actually start to see the symptoms. Is there anything that can be done to prevent that? Yeah, you can get uh, fire blight sprays. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically an antibiotic material. Streptomycin. Yeah. Streptomycin. Yeah. And uh, usually those sprays start going on about the time the blooms open. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, again, let me ask if there, yeah, and we do, have, do we have a fact Yes, we do that. have actually a home orchard um, spray schedule for, you know, pears and apples and everything that's on the HGIC website. Okay. So it would give you a guide of when to spray what. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, we've got a call from the capital city where they have decided to describe themselves and attract visitors by saying that they are famously hot. And um, Tamika, I hope you're not too terribly hot up there in Columbia tonight, but we'll try to help you with whatever's giving you a problem. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have planted some squash and tomatoes and um, watermelon and a couple of watermelons and uh -huh. cucumbers. Um, my squash, they have big, huge leaves. I mean, just gorgeous leaves, just running, beautiful blooms, everything. They start, the little squash start to come on, mm -hmm. and about two days later, 
they draw up Alrighty. like they're not getting enough water or mm -hmm. something. Okay. Um, Poor well, pollination. Um, so what do you think is going Not on? properly pollinated, mm -hmm. yeah. So the little, the little immature fruit is there, mm -hmm. yeah. but in order for it to needs to be mature, pollinated. It has to be pollinated. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the flowers, you know, if you look at the male flowers and the female flowers, behind the female flower you'll see what looks like a little shape of a fruit, uh -huh. and that can be a guide to help them know, you know, what's going on. But I would look, like we talked about, you know, planting some things that would encourage pollinating insects to come. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a... Uh, and sometimes, although she, apparently, she has little fruits, which is wonderful, so we know that that's happening, but sometimes do people, some, if they get heavy-handed with the nitrogen, can that be a problem Yeah, too, over, over fertilization is enough, and it comes to mind, and even with those female flowers that have the little ovaries on there, sometimes maybe if there's too much fertilization, really? they may abort those, oh. or there could be something else going on. I still think this one's probably related to mm -hmm. pollination. Um, but but just, too much nitrogen. Just be careful with the fertilization and not, not to over fertilize okay. the Because you know. she was saying the leaves were so big right. and yeah. beautiful and green, which made it sound like maybe she'd put a good bit of fertilizer right. on them. Right. Oh, there's a lot to be. A lot be, to do. A lot to think <laughs> about. A lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's better to think about something than to do it, it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> no, you still got to try. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I meant to sometimes sit on your hand and not do something. All right. Not, yeah. No more fertilizer. Okay. Um, well, we. <laughs> Um, we are so excited, as we said earlier, to have um, Van Bacall with us, and he's going to tell us about a really exciting event at the farmer's market. I'm going to go learn about that, and while I'm making my way over there, we're going to check in with Teresa. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. I think it was last week I mentioned that plants can be tricky, and I was reminded of that when I saw this photo that was shared on our Making It Grow Facebook page asking for identification. And Dr. John identified it as uh, probably a species of goldenrod, but I think the tricky part is this round structure that I imagine the person thought was probably a fruiting structure of some sort. Turns out that's actually a gall, and you see probably galls all over the place. They are an abnormal swelling. Uh, and that's in the plant tissues as a response to some kind of stress, or it might be bacteria, it might be a fungus. Usually, uh, most of them are caused by insects and mites. So, you know, just be observant. You never know what you're going to find, and uh, you can always be creative. Dr. John suggested if you let these dry out, you might even use them as drumsticks. See, you just never know what you might learn on making it grow. Let's check in with Amanda and her guest at the side counter. Well, thank you, Teresa. Um, we're going to give a little drum roll because we're so happy to have Van McCall. And Van is the chief lending officer with Ag South, and but he's here for another person. But just for, in case people don't know, what exactly is Ag South? Well, man, Ag South is part of the nationwide farm credit system that we're about to celebrate our 100th birthday. Just like we are. Yes, we, we have been around for a long time, and our history has been completely agricultural lending. That's what we do. Okay. And the AgAware program is all about the future. Uh, the, the determining factor of where we go is how we transfer our knowledge to the next generation. And that's what AgAware is all about. The, the system has a mission to prepare the next generation. AgSouth has a vision through the AgAware program to translate that in our footprint area, which is 59 counties in Georgia, 34 in South Carolina. And there are three phases of this, so let's talk about them as they occur. Tell me what the first one is. Okay. The first phase in, is our workshops. Uh, we teach a, a very in-depth, comprehensive financial ag business workshop. Uh, it's a full day on a Saturday. We do four of them, two in South Carolina, two in Georgia, and it's risk management, balance sheets, income statements, uh, the, the full technology, uh, marketing products. The not fun part, not the growing, but the part that's hard for a lot of people. But the thing that we do, and a lot of people is amazed when they come, is we make these classes very interesting. And, and, and we get a lot of comments about how, how interesting and engaged that people feel in the classes. And these are aimed at what sorts of people? Young farmers, beginning farmers, small farmers, minority farmers, uh, anyone coming into the, the agricultural production. Because what's happening with our family farms now? Well, the last statistic I saw that uh, within the next two decades, 70% of the family farms in this nation are going to go through a generational transfer. Oh. 
So we have to do what we can to prepare the next generation, and that's what AgAware is all about. Well, that Saturday workshop program sounds like it's fundamentally important, but I think at the State Farmers Market in West Columbia, you're going to have something that's a little more interactive and yes. perhaps aimed at a little bit different group. So tell yeah. me what you've got planned. Well, that's our second phase of AgAware. It's all about the community outreach projects that we do and the vision there is that we want to pull all parts of society together in a work project or a, a day like this to promote agriculture and the benefit that ag has to the other 98 percent of society so that they can see the importance of agriculture. Well you've picked our state vegetable um, and these are good looking by the way um, as as kind of the way to make this happen so what, right. what, 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 what when people come what are they going to be doing with collard greens? What's, are, what's this counting collard oh, greens all about? Counting collards is part of our ag experience and it as a matter of fact these collards of course started as one of these little packs of seed right no. here, yes. And the <laughs> Some one, people don't know that. Uh, the wonderful employees of the South Carolina Department of Agriculture actually have been working for two months to prepare this day. They have planted us four planters in different age sizes, growth stages of the collar plant. Mm -hmm. We have the, the, the what's going to happen in the counting collards ag experience is that it's all about educating our youth but when youth come we want the parents to come and watch because they are amazed at it also so what would happen is there are five stages mm -hmm. they will walk up to the bank and simulate we will do a simulated loan we will make the the youth a loan and they will receive make believe money, they'll sign a note, then they'll take that and go to the first station, they'll plant collards and learn all about instruction, then they'll go to the intermediate stage and learn about the nurturing and care of that crop, and then they'll go to the mature stage, learn about harvesting, and from there processing, packaging, marketing, they'll eventually sell their crop, come back to the bank, pay off their operating loan, and they'll learn a term interest, they'll learn what interest is, and we teach them what profit is because what they have left, they take that profit and then they go to the the really fun part we have all these games that they can redeem that profit to play games isn't that fun we have ladder toss we have frisbee toss we have a giant water balloon launcher <laughs> so they're going to have a great day and uh, it, it's it's going to be very exciting and what time is this it's going to start at 10 o'clock uh, through through noon we're going to have a short dedication service at 1030 where Ag South Farm Credit Ag Aware Program is dedicating a traditional South Carolina juggling bench. <laughs> come on, let's do it. Yes, come on. <laughs> we better not fall off, yeah. have we? So, uh, and, and there's a, a reason for choosing that because historically their tradition is it brought That's right. couples together. You end up yes, kind of yeah. Yeah, 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 the yeah, old yeah. southern phrase, yeah, courting oil. Yeah, you know? yeah. So we want to bring though all parts yes. of society mm -hmm. together to understand the value the of agriculture. The consumers, the producers, and for people to really understand where food comes yes. from and what's involved. But then there's a third prong third of part, this. So Tell us what the that third is, part please. is our speakers bureau, where myself and other Ag South employees. And let me say this: we have such wonderful employees, and they are the ones that are making this day happen. I, I've just got to give them that. They work so hard. But we have some other employees that work with us, and we go to any event we can uh, if they need a speaker to talk about the future of agriculture. All right. That's what we're there for. So we can call and make arrangements for y'all to come. And so this first event, though, that we're talking about um, is going to be on the 28th. Yes. at the West Columbia State Farmers Market. That's correct. Um, and I think there are a lot of other activities planned around it. And we're going to come back at the end and let you tell us exactly where we can go to find out all the information. Very good. All right. It's been fun learning about this. And I'm, and I'm just curious to about where these collard greens are going at the end of the show. Well, <laughs> they may be on someone's table. <laughs> I mean, it is wonderful to have, um, have a representative here from Ag South, and we appreciate that, and we appreciate what the South Carolina Department of Agriculture does, and um, so thank you for being with us. Thank Teresa, um, tell me what's happening over there with you and your chatters. Oh, it's busy, 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 and one of our chatters shared a great photo today to, and said, look for this in your neighborhood markets. So at the side counter, we heard about investing in agriculture, and you can do that by supporting the South Carolina Department of Agriculture's Certified South Carolina Grown, and there's Certified South Carolina Products, Certified South Carolina Grown, and even Fresh on the Market, where uh, restaurants have to have at least 25% of the 
things on the menu, either grown or products from South Carolina. You can find all the information about that program on the South Carolina Department of Agriculture's website. And Amanda, I hear that there's even a certified South Carolina artist. Is that true? <laughs> there is. Um, as a matter of fact, I have um, some artists in my house, and I'm getting ready to get them certified because they certainly seem like South Carolina people to me. Um, but that is a, um, you know, this is such a great program for us to highlight the wonderful things that happen in South Carolina. We've got some, uh, so the South Carolina Department of South Carolina Art Department um, Arts Commission has come up with this great way to um, remind us that we should always be joyful and support everything that is South Carolina. We want to keep our economy strong. Um, we've got a caller. Mary's calling us from Columbia. Mary, we thank you for calling us tonight. And how can we help you? Well, I'm not a, a gardener, but I'm dying to have some fresh tomatoes. Uh -huh. So I planted two tomato plants, and they're just growing just beautifully and putting out blooms. And one of them, all of a sudden, the plant is beginning to wilt. Oh. The other one looks fine. Oh. Um, and I've got tomatoes on that one plant that's wilting, so I'm not sure if there's something underneath that okay. uh, Can you just why would I is there why any, would one wilt? Can, is there a little bit anything more visually that you've noticed about it or just just a, and how quickly did it happen? No, not a thing. Okay. All righty. Yeah. Oh, it's possible she might have bacterial wilt going on. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of wilt diseases yeah. that are active now. Bacterial wilt is one, and um, southern wilt, southern blight, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sclerotium yeah. is yeah. another wilt that's uh, active right now. So. tomato wilts? Tomato spotted. Tomato spotted wilt could be yeah. a, a virus. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. But if it's just green and it's just yeah, wilting, it's, it's probably just the bacterial wilt. She didn't really see yeah. 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 She didn't um, notice anything else. If it's bacterial else. wilt, though, what's the diagnostic? Can't you? Yeah, you can cut the bottom of the stem and put it like in a little glass of water, uh -huh. clear glass, and you would see that stream of ooze. You but know, it doesn't, does it really make much difference? Are most of the wilts fatal? Typically, if the whole plant's yeah. If the whole plant's wilted, that plant's probably lost, and probably the best thing she can do right now, since she has other tomato plants, is to pull it out, stems, leaves, roots, and the attached soil and all, put it in a plastic bag right there in her garden spot, and go ahead and put it in the garbage and hope that in it doesn't... In the household garbage, yeah. Right, yeah. and hope it doesn't spread to the okay. uh, neighboring plants. Um, and with the tomato spotted wilt virus, I know there are varieties, I believe, that you can put out. Is it too late? Could you think she could plant another one? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you can you can plant a late crop of tomatoes until mid July in most of South Carolina, um, so she could look for something that's wilt resistant. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And again, um, I think I just whenever somebody calls with a problem, I just go to, to HGIC, Clemson HGIC, um, because it is just such a wealth of information, and and it's helped me with so many personal problems and problems also that clients when they call at the office. Um, well, we went someplace that just wasn't a problem at all, except it was a little bit far away to drive, but it was so very beautiful. The drive is beautiful. Um, McCormick County is a beautiful county, and it was wonderful to go there and meet a relatively um, new resident there who has made a beautiful footprint on her little corner of McCormick County. <music> County, South Carolina, on the shores of Lake Thurman, and I am with Zimbabwean-born and world-traveled new friend, Barb Hinkle. Barb, how did you design this landscape to suit your family's needs? The landscape, I started with an easy-to-maintain garden, but being who I am, I get carried away. <laughs> And I wanted to have a Mediterranean look because we lived in Italy and just loved the whole environment, the buildings and the gardens and the plants always looked so luxuriant. And I kept having that image in my mind to try and emulate that. 
When you came here, you said you took one look at the soil and said, oh my goodness, I've got to do something before I put plants in the ground. And so this, what did you do? That is very true. I enriched it. I had a uh, truckload of topsoil brought in. And particularly in my courtyard, I really nourished the soil with the topsoil and mulch. And over the years, just kept adding it. And my secret weapon are worms. <laughs> <laughs> I go down to the fishing store and buy a little packet of fish, uh, fishing worms. And we put them in the ground, my granddaughters and I. And they multiply, which is wonderful. <laughs> and as I look around, I see so many treasures. Of course, you are very fortunate here. You have the cooler air temperatures that let you have peonies, which are so yes. lovely. And yet you also have agaves. And that is a very unusual one. Tell me about it. I don't know what to tell you other than I love it. It's just a beautiful, exciting plant. It's quite vicious with its thorns. And I bought it a couple of years ago. It was rather expensive, so I only bought one. And it's created all these little pups, <laughs> which have been promised to friends. Oh, well, well don't, don't give them all away. They certainly help set the scene. And as we go down, we see things that remind us of the Italian landscape. We see gravel used and a small amount of turf. And then as we get towards the house, oh, what joyful things. The vertical accents are so much fun. So tell me about those. I started off with these uh, sky rocket uh, junipers and they fit perfectly into the landscape because they don't get too tall, they don't get too wide. And then I thought, I really need a Mediterranean cypress because this is a Mediterranean style house. And that's where I bought uh, several of the Mediterranean cypress. Unfortunately, this winter, the deer enjoyed them as well. And I shall fire my dog, who's supposed to keep the deer <laughs> at bay. <laughs> and then towards the house, you, you've pruned things up to give us that umbrella look. And you've used a lot of vines. And you said that um, from your kitchen window, often you have a very beautiful view. I do. I, I enjoy it. And the vines that are growing over the kitchen window and the front door and over the arbor are the Lady Banks rose, the yellow. And it's supposed to have 30 to 60,000 blooms on it. And I can believe it. It was just stunning this and, spring. And even though that one's over, in a corner of the house is a remarkable bloomer. Tell me about that rose. This is a red. I call it a Lady Banks, but it's not, as I was corrected at the nursery. But it does the same climbing aspect as the Lady Banks. I like it better than the yellow because it's bloomed all last year. You told me it just goes on. It just goes on and on. And, on. and, and behind on. me, I have a trellis that I've started to grow it up, and it's doing beautifully. I put it in pots. And I just love this rose. I love it too. It's gorgeous. And I think that um, in the afternoons or the evening when it's time to have a glass of Italian wine, you have created an outdoor dining room. Tell me about that. I have. It first started off with the uh, breezeway and growing grapes up and over the uh, arbor. And that worked perfectly. That was the look I was trying to get, was the, the vines with the grapes dripping down and the coolness and the shade. And we eat out every night, weather permitting, whether it's on the uh, breezeway or on the back deck or in the courtyard. Because now it's just my husband and I, we enjoy sitting at that little table with the uh, twinkling lights and as you said, enjoying a good glass of Italian wine. And on that back deck, um, you have eating spaces there. You have beautiful, um, wonderfully blooming, colorful plants. And you get to look down on another little area that you've created a garden in. Yeah. Um, another small amount of grass surrounded by more plants. Tell me how that area came into being. Well, the water features, I love to hear the sound of running water. And that's where doing a water feature at the back and also in my courtyard was a necessity, simply to add to the ambiance of the moment. And ponds and water features are hard work, but it's worth it. And then of course, you've left a wonderful natural area, partially because the core controls some of that, but right. also you said you love the transition into the woodlands. Yes. 
and this piece of property has all these little gullies and interesting trees is just it spoke to me when we came and looked at the property it's it's just a magical piece of property well barb i think that you also listened very carefully and heard nature speak to you thank you and created a wonderful place for your family and for the natural elements around you thank you so much for letting us be here today thank you for coming it was my pleasure Wonderful, wonderful garden that's been created by a truly lovely lady and um, her son has been a wonderful help to her and I think everyone in the community is so proud to have that there. Um, Corey, I have some tomatoes on my hat that fortunately came through. I think everybody should plant a cherry tomato. Are they, aren't <laughs> they always right. the easy ones? <laughs> I'm um, jealous of your okra too. <laughs> I don't have any yet. Just, well, don't worry, we'll have up with this hot weather. But you've got a tomato that's having a little problem, so tell us what you've got there. Yeah, I was out early this morning in my garden in my little tomato plot and um, saw some of this early blight going on. Yeah, that's got um, a good, that looks good, Hold it just yeah. like that. Okay. Um, early blight, you'll typically see these dark lesions on lower leaves near the, near the soil line about this time of year with these yellow halos around them. Yes. If you actually could see down in there, you would see concentric rings in those lesions like a, a bullseye. Okay. Um, and the way I like to manage it is when I see these starting, I'd like to just pluck them off. Oh, all right. Um, and because what happens is it's mostly a soil-borne disease and it'll splash from the soil oh, up onto the lower leaves. Okay. And so I take those lower leaves off so that it doesn't move up the plant. Um, do you just drop them on the ground or do you no, take I them out No, I usually throw the them garden. in the trash. And, so don't leave them in the garden. Right, and, and Millie was yeah. doing this yesterday. We learned on the, on the ride down here she was doing the same thing. Um, so we were, we we're on the oh, same page with that. Okay. But another way to manage this is with mulch uh, to, oh, to keep okay. that soil from All splashing right. up onto the okay. foliage. All right, so um, we don't have to spray, I mean, just by just cultural can right. help. Right, there uh, are fungicides, yeah. but I prefer, well, so to, do it. I prefer yeah. to do it without the fungicides okay. just by Okay. Well, thank you for showing off. that to us. Sure. That's My a pleasure. good idea. Gives, you know, and any time we go out in the garden and visit the garden, we, we, we're we better gardeners, I think, because we learn things oh, and yeah. see things. Definitely. Thank you. Well, Thelma's calling us from Fletcher, North Carolina. What a treat to hear from you, Thelma. And um, what's happening in Fletcher, North Carolina? Well, I'm having blueberry problems. You are? Well, that's My unusual. My blueberry bushes are quite full of berries, but they're falling off. And the same thing happened last year. A uh, good crop of berries originally, but then they, by the end of June, most of them were on the ground. Um, how long have you had these plants in your yard? I'm guessing five, six years. And usually, do you get a good crop of blueberries? No, they're just becoming mature plants and big enough to do well. Okay, and did you plant ones that were specifically recommended for your area, or did you just get them at a store and bring them home? Uh, we planted rabbit eye, I believe is the name of, name of right. it, and a couple of them we got from friends who had berries in this area. Okay. And they're, they're were, were doing well. Were the, were the berries turning or were they just dropping off green? Were they actually changing color? They're beginning to turn pink. Pink. Okay. And then they drop off mm -hmm. at that point? Yes. They they're, look like, most of them look like they're good sized berries. Mm -hmm. Now last year I noticed that a lot of them were the immature little tiny berries. Okay. What you think? I don't know. Um, that seems un kind of unusual on blueberries. She did plant the right variety, yeah. I think. Right, Probably. it's the right species, mm -hmm. rabbit eye. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what varieties she had. If she dug them up from her neighbors, there's a chance, or her friends, there's a chance they could be the same variety. And we do know that you get better pollination if you plant different varieties with overlapping bloom times. I think probably her best solution is going to be to take a sample into her county extension office up there in North Carolina and, and let them investigate the problem a little All bit right. more okay. All in depth. Good enough. Right. Um, and then, Corey, um, I think we wanted to ask once more for you to remind people if they want to take your Master Gardener program, how they can find that information. 
Uh, probably the easiest way to find that information will be to go to uh, clemson.edu slash Greenville, and that'll take you to the Greenville County website and it's there on our events calendar. Okay, but you've got another event coming up too. You're just a busy man. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, uh, we're celebrating being 100 years old, Amanda. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, the Clemson Extension, or the Cooperative Extension Service nationwide is 100 years old, and of course, South Carolina had a pivotal role in, the, in, in how the Extension Service took shape 100 years ago. But we wanted to have a little event for the people of Greenville County to come out and meet our agents and uh, see what we do and, and what we're continuing to do, what we've done in the past and what we continue to do for the citizens of Greenville County in South Carolina. And that'll be Saturday, June 28th at the TD Farmers Market in downtown Greenville on Main Street. We'll be at the corner of uh, MACB and, and Main Street in downtown Greenville from 8.30 to 12.30. And uh, we'd love for people to come out. We'll have activities for the children and adults alike. And uh, we'll be there to answer your gardening questions. Master gardeners will be on hand. And, okay. And uh, be a fun time. And, um, and that's a great place for people to come and get South, South Carolina grown local produce. A lot, of, a lot mm -hmm. of produce at that market. And I bet there are things to mm -hmm. eat, too. I just yep. wish I could be there under those beautiful trees. <laughs> what a wonderful well, city. We'd love to have you. Greenville is. All righty. Well, Van, we want to tell you how much we appreciate having you make the trip you're making the trip to be with us today. And, um, and we want to find out exactly what, where we can go on the internet um, or call to find out when these programs are going to take place. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, you can go to agsouthfc.com. Uh, it's on the screen. Uh, and you can find out everything you want to know about the AgAware program. Also about our workshops that are coming up. We have one in Clemson, one in Orangeburg Calhoun Technical College, and two in Georgia. You can do the online registration right there on the website also. Just click on the AgAware icon. Uh, also, I'd like to say we have another great event September 28th. We have just released it. This is the first time we have announced it. We have an AgAware corn maze at Cooley Farms up uh, near Spartanburg, South Carolina. So watch for that. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, we've really enjoyed it. And I uh, want to say that as the AgAware program gives back to the generation, we are a borrow-owned cooperative at AgSouth, and we have a track record of returning 25% of our borrower's interest back to them over a 23-year history. So we're just giving back to our community. Well, we are proud of that. Um that spirit that y'all have and proud and happy for what y'all are doing for the, to ensure that the future of agriculture stays strong in South Carolina. And um, Teresa, we want to thank you so much for being with us. And are you going to have another hot day in the water tomorrow with the children? Well, we're going to sort of take things easy tomorrow, mostly in the classroom uh, doing some of that stuff that they, the kids won't be happy about. We have to actually learn some things at camp. But we have a great field trip day planned Thursday, going to Lynch's River to go kayaking and even doing some swimming in the afternoon. It's been a great night in the chat room. Thanks for joining me. Don't forget, you can post your questions on our Making It Grow Facebook page. Do be patient. I will have to admit that I have had about zero time to answer questions this week, but we'll We'll do our best to get those answered and to get those plants identified for you. And check out the Making It Grow website. Lots of information there and even exclusive videos that you don't always see on TV. Amanda? All righty. Thank you so much. And um, I want to thank you for bringing the, making the trip down. And um, you have a new, um, a new mouth at your table. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And she already and loves sweet, South Carolina grown sweet potatoes and squash. Does so. she? I was going to add how old is that little precious baby? She's six months. Six months. So we're mm -hmm. mighty happy for you. Thank and you've got a lot of big mouths at your house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> um, three, three boys. Three boys. Plus a husband. But they're yeah. good slave labor in the garden. Oh, shoot. I bet they are. <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute. I know you, I know you treat them sweet. And um, we want to thank you so much for being so sweet to us and joining us every Tuesday night for Making It Grow. We hope You'll be with us next Tuesday and every Tuesday to come. Mickey, Mickey will be with us next week too. Bye bye. <laughs>